Hey everybody, welcome to Pivot 2020. I'm Jamie Beard. I'm Executive Director of the Geothermal Entrepreneurship Organization at the University of Texas at Austin. We are so excited about the energy that, that has, has collected around the world about this event these past weeks and welcome everyone that's joining. We have you know, 20 countries and 12 time zones that have tuned in for all of you that are tuning in in the middle of the night around the world. Thank you very much for, 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 for coming and sticking with us. Uh, what we're going to do all week is, is really dive into the concepts of, of, of being able to enable geothermal energy anywhere in the world, scalable geothermal, Te a lot of technical discussions about different concepts and how to make them happen, some discussions about project development and, and, and really stepping through the process of making geothermal work, removing the obstacles, regulatory barriers, permitting barriers, etc. This panel today, the, the, the starting panel, is going to talk about a higher level strategy, right? So we're, we're looking at, at, at the broader vision and, and asking folks from a lot of different entities, different types of entities, what their thoughts are about geothermal, how they're thinking of it, what they see in the short, middle, and, and long term for their geothermal strategies. Um, and 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 want to get a lot of different perspectives. What we're hoping is to really get some ideas flowing and to get it all on the table to help entities that are considering and interested in geothermal, um, excited about doing that and 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 really thinking about how they could do it themselves. So without further ado, let me let me introduce my panel. I've got today Lise Rodionov. She is the uh, Global Director of Sustainability and ESG at Schlumberger. We've got Robert Lance Cook. He's president and CTO of a, of a brand new geothermal startup called Sage Geosystems. He's also a recently retired uh, chief scientist of Shell for 37 years. Allison Book is VP of Energy Transition at Baker Hughes. Scott Tinker is the director of the Bureau of, Bureau of Economic Geology in Texas and is also the state geologist of Texas. Merritt Bromer is Executive Director of the International Geothermal Association. And Patrick Walsh, Walsh is Vice President of Geothermal Resources at ORMAT, which is a geothermal company, leading geothermal company global. All right, so what we're going to do now is we, I will introduce each panelist by name, and they will have a few moments, about two minutes apiece, to introduce themselves, introduce their entities, and talk about you know, a, a summary of their thoughts about what they think about geothermal, what they've been planning on geothermal, or, or what they're interested in in the space. And then we'll launch into some questions and answers. Toward the end of our session, we're going to open up, um, we're going to open up for some audience questions. So please, um, audience, if you would like to ask a question of the panelists, um, type your question into the chat box and we will get to as many of them as we can. All right, so without further ado, Lise, why don't we start with you? Lise Rodionov of Slumberger. Thanks, Jamie. I am uh, honored to be here with such a distinguished panel. So as Jamie said, I look after sustainability for Schlumberger, both social and environmental. So geothermal being, you know, in one of the actions in our suite of actions in terms of capturing the opportunity around energy transition. Obviously, this is of interest and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, geothermal as a business is not new to Schlumberger. Uh, we execute projects in this space through Geothermex, a company that was started in the early 70s and acquired by Schlumberger in, in 2010. So we've got hundreds of projects around the world um, that we've executed in kind of the high heat geothermal space. And then recently we talked about a new venture in the low heat um, geothermal space. Um, and I think on a, a, the closing panel for the, the session this week, our, the manager of that business will be there to, to talk about that as well. So as I said, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Lise. Now we're going to go to Lance Cook, um, CTO of Sage Geosystems and former chief scientist of Shell. Okay, yeah, my background, I, I was a chief scientist at Shell when I retired uh, about three years ago. Um, I was also vice president of technology. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, geothermal, Shell had a pretty large geothermal effort in the late 90s up through about 2005. Um, and in that process, my partner in SAGE Geosystem Levering and I developed something called the Mono Diameter Well, specifically targeted towards deep geothermal. Uh, in 2005, uh, Shell ended up 
moving out of the geothermal area and uh, a lot of these projects were shelved. Well, uh, Lev and I are back on the case, uh, back in contact with some of our old uh, Shell geothermal friends like Bob Worrell and Bruce Stewart, and uh, uh, we're back at it again. So thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Lance. Now we're gonna go to Allison Book with Baker Hughes. Hi, uh, I'm actually, I, I, my, my background sounds a lot like Lee's in terms of, uh, I, I have the equivalent kind of role for, for Baker Hughes. I'm also in charge of our ESG performance and portfolio. Uh, and I focus a lot on emissions reduction within our company. And so that's, that's a small E, part of the big E in environment, as well as uh, solutions for our customers. Geothermal is one part, and we've been in the geothermal business as Baker Hughes for about three decades or more. Uh, and that's in many different applications, whether it's high or low temp geothermal, and it's the entire uh, supply chain into that system. And, and I would go so far as to say the value chain, whether it's on the turbine side, top sides, or the, in the subsurface space. Uh, we've been a consistent presence for many decades. Thanks, Allison. Okay, mm -hmm. now we'll go to Scott Tinker, Director of the Bureau of Economic Geology. Hey, good morning, afternoon, evening, good night to some of you. So I've uh, I've studied energy globally for many years, and you can see this in our film switch and switch on. Let me just share a couple of points from the global look to set this geothermal context a little bit. You know, visiting 65 countries, I can say without a doubt, and you all know this, reliable affordable energy just transforms lives. CO2 is a major concern globally, but CO2 concerns won't stop Southeast Asia from building more new more new coal capacity starting in 2018 than all the world's non-hydro renewables combined today. And that new coal capacity adds to Southeast Asia's existing coal, which is already three times the rest of the world combined. So that's a carbon checkpoint. The sun, wind, waves, and tides are renewable, but turbines, panels, and batteries aren't. They're low density source of energy and require extensive infrastructure to collect heat, light, and motion. So that new infrastructure means a lot of new mining. The sun and the wind are also intermittent. So this steady load following source of electricity, they need that for backup. That's where geothermal comes in. It's has the capacity to provide a significant component of steady, no emissions electricity, as well as potentially energy storage. Like all forms of energy, it's a resource though. It's not great everywhere, site matters. Texas has some interesting advantages there. Like all forms of energy existing and extracting geothermal requires investment, talented teams of industry, government, uh, ind uh, academics and NGOs. So the BEG where I am conducts research and facilitates Things like this, these big major programs, carbon capture, earthquake monitoring, nanotech, et cetera. So we stand ready to help in this area and really look forward to the week. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks so much, Scott. Awesome. Merritt Bromer from the International Geothermal Association. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure being here today. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, even for the ones that I saw joining in from New Zealand. This is amazing to see. Um, I am indeed the executive director of the International Geothermal Association and myself, I come from oil and gas and I've made the jump to the other side. It is incredibly to see that in the past few years, the interest, but also the uptake of geothermal energy has seen an acceleration. I'm convinced we're kicking off the geothermal decades, but I'm also convinced we need the entire ecosystem of that energy space to come to come together and bring this forward. Because what I see from an oil and gas experience, it's not just the technology that we need. It's not just, let's say, that mindset of global thinking that we need. We really need to see some stiff lobbying, some creation of coalition, and specifically we need to engage with our politicians around the globe to understand and to create awareness of geothermal and how it fits that net zero future. So Jamie, specifically to you and your GEO group, I think this is exciting. This is fantastic that you've had the energy to kick this off. This is amazing how you bring the entire energy space together and it is also needed for the coming decade to bring this all together. And thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Merritt. Awesome. And last but not least, Patrick Walsh with ORMAT. Hi, good morning, Jamie. I'm really excited to be here and thank you so much for putting together this panel and, and the program for the entire week. Um, a little about myself, I'm a geologist who has transitioned from oil and gas to geothermal. I've been with ORMAT for about 12 years developing new projects. As a company, we've been steadily growing and now uh, own and operate about nine, a little over 900 megawatts 
with plans for growth of about 100 megawatts a year over the next few years. Um, we have a global portfolio, as you said, so we're working uh, United States, Guatemala, Indonesia, Central America, and Kenya. And um, in terms of the potential, it, it is huge, as, as the conference will, will discuss throughout the week. Um, I think some of the things we need to talk about are, in terms of strategy, are both the EGS and supercritical, which I see there's a lot of focus on, but also conventional, which is where RMAT's focused at the moment. Um, and, and I would say offshore, which nobody has tended to talk about, but a lot of the technology is already there. Oil and gas can have a huge impact. So um, I'll say it probably clearly, the Gulf of Mexico is not the, the place to start there, despite oil and gas uh, experience, but there are some high temperature offshore places that I think we should be talking about throughout the week. Thanks again. Perfect. Thank, thanks, Patrick. All right, so let's launch, guys. Um, we've got a, a lot of questions to to get through, and then the audience is gonna is gonna throw a whole bunch more your way. So, you know, let's let's frame the discussion a little bit before we launch. And and just um, because we are limited in in our virtual background and the platform here, I'm going to toss questions to specific panelists just for ease of production. But panelists, uh, feel feel free to jump in if you have thoughts. Um, no worries about that, and and um, and and have it a, be a free flowing discussion. But I'll throw the questions out to a particular panelist to start. So Merritt, you're first. All right. So you, you you talk about your formal former oil and gas experience. You were Shell and Total. Um, you jumped into IGA really excited about thinking about how skills, assets, technologies, et cetera, can transfer. And you've also put your hands into a lot of companies, right? You've been talking with folks about this for, for years now. What are you hearing on the street? What's, what's word on the street over the past maybe year and, and accelerating the last six months from oil and gas companies about where their interests lie? in geothermal and you can also you know touch on how that might vary uh based on geographical location yes no a very good question i think it sets the scene very nicely for this entire uh week so to speak so indeed speaking on behalf of the iega i can clearly see differences from from region to region and even from continent to continent and also coming from that oil and gas patch as you quite nicely put it i think it's really interesting to see and also to touch base on scalability so coming from the perspective of the geothermal community what you tend to to see within geothermal is that most of the time projects are tailor-made, they're prototype if you like. So what you see is that there is a customer who is in need of, for instance, electricity at a specific location and then there is a technology out there called geothermal technology, whether it's a power plant in flash or whether it's a binary power plant, it should not matter. It is about serving electricity to the grid. And those projects tend to be very prototyped in the sense that they're tailor-made customer focus, very unique. And that has, I think, been the case for quite a long time and has built a very mature and very traditional, very conservative here and there as well, geothermal community who is excellent about what it does on the ground to the local community fit for purpose. But it has sort of created a perception of geothermal that it is not scalable, that it is, well, because of the prototype approach, it is very expensive and every, every, every time basically the wheel needs to be reinvented. So what I see and what I hear a lot from both that oil and gas network that I still, of course, have and talk a lot with, um, as well as those geothermal companies who are interested to develop projects across the globe and across different countries, how can we scale? And I also see that there is a lot of interest, of course, for the technology push, but equally I see there is a lot of interest to understand that legislation and that regulation on that energy space. Because it's not easy sometimes to quantify geothermal. Yes, it's a resource. Yes, it's heat that we derive. Yes, we produce electricity, but where does it exactly fit? Because we have to mine basically for the heat that is beneath our feet. And hence for a politician it's not always easy to understand when we're not even mentioned in the book of law, if you like, in the European Union, for instance, how do you deal with that when you build that net zero future? So the conversations I've been having over the past three years that I've now at the helm of the IGA is both understanding the technology, how can we scale, how can we go basically geothermal everywhere, whether we do that through the electricity closed loop going deeper and hotter, or whether we see that there is also an a huge demand for clean heat and clean heat 
doesn't necessarily need to be 200 degrees. If you look at industry's needs for low grade heat, it's somewhere between 65, 120 degrees, and I do speak Celsius here. Um, and hence, there is also that customer approach for greenhouse operators, for all kinds of low end entropy needs for industry, process industry, uh, cleaning industry needs that just need that clean heat. And that direct use opportunity is something that people are quite interested about as long as we can do that everywhere. And that's the hot topic that I think I would really like to explore from a strategic point of view. How can we scale? How can we win together? How can we make geothermal everywhere, but with an end customer in mind across the globe? Well, that's interesting. And, I, and I'd like to actually follow up with Lance um, and, and ask him to, to expand on something you said, but also on something he said in his intro which is, you know, he, he was at an operator engaged in the space. The operator lost interest because of market conditions, but now he's back. So that begs the question because he's operator blood, 37 years in the industry. Um, why are you back, Lance? Like what, why geothermal? Why not solar? And why aren't you starting a solar or wind company instead of a geothermal company? Well, I, I'll make it quick, but I, you know, ba basically a, a prettier girl came along. Uh, so if, if, you, if, you, if you go back to the, uh, the time when we left geothermal, we, it was a transition period, I think, for most of the majors. And we were moving from this mindset of peak oil, where we, we said all the easy oil is gone, to holy hell, look at what Chesapeake and these guys are doing in unconventionals. Right. And so we were in a catch up mode in 2005 or so where we where we didn't have the staff and uh, we needed to move into unconventionals. Plus, we were expanding because of high oil prices, our deep water and other initiatives. So uh, at the time, I was uh, engineering manager and skill pool manager and where better to get people for uh, uh, for unconventional stuff than uh, projects like uh, geothermal. Geothermal was long term. We needed we needed an army to try to get in the game on unconventionals. And uh, that's really, from my standpoint, what happened to geothermal from where I came from. Back so, to how, so how is it different now? What, what conditions have created interest now in your mind? Well, if, if let me just say this, if I'm if I were sitting in big oil right now, I'm having a discussion right now, is, is uh, unconventionals the growth opportunity I thought it was 15 years ago? Is it something I want to put a whole lot more money in or not? Uh, I could see major operators uh, deciding to double down and say, hey, look at all these cheap properties I can get right now and going into unconventionals bigger, but I expect some will say, hey, you know, this this isn't just, this isn't the growth opportunity for us and pull back. And in the pullback, those operators, I think are the ones that'll be asking questions. Okay, where is our next growth opportunity? And if, if I'm there, geothermal probably is on my radar screen. Got it. How about an oil service perspective? So let's 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 go to Allison and Lee's. Lee's, you first. What what are your thoughts? You know, Merritt introduced two concepts: the electricity concept, you know, the the deep and hot concepts, and and also the possibility of of deep direct use or or direct use heating heating concepts. Is there is there any particular concept that's that's most interesting from an oil service perspective right now? Well, I. I think I'll answer that by thinking about, you know, where we're thinking, we, what do we bring to the table that, that isn't there already? So, you know, where we think we can leverage the opportunity is a number of things. One of them is um, just the relevant companies around well construction, subsurface, analytics, et cetera. But in particular, when you think about retrofitting at commercial scale and densely populated um, urban areas, optimizing well design and surface footprint with uh, the subsurface is something that you know we can bring to the table from an oil and gas service perspective um, as an example you know we applied this technology for heating and cooling we have a large manufacturing facility in uh, in france in clamar 
and what would have taken like a soccer field um, footprint size to, to power that building, we've done in kind of a 10 by 10 meter space, saving emissions, saving OPEX as well. So uh, that the application of the commercial space, like I said, kind of in densely populated in urban areas um, and leveraging that ability to optimize the, the well design is something I think we bring. And the other, you know, that, that Merit ancient mentioned that I would build on is this idea of global scale. So, you know, we've got geothermal projects in more than 50 countries around the world, but from a, a traditional oil and gas perspective, we operate in, in more than 100, you know, twice that 120 um, places. And geothermal being more of a regional, um, traditionally regional business, every day we are applying best practice, risk management, process technology locally, and sifting through like I said, kind of the best practice cream of the crop and then distributing, disseminating that on a global scale. So the ability to leverage that global footprint um, as again, something we see as an opportunity for us in this space. How about Baker, Allison? What do you think? You're on mute, Allison. Okay. There you go. I don't know we got how you. That okay, so <laughs> So, so Baker Hughes is, is no longer a strictly oil field services company. And so about, um, you know, middle of the year last year, we pivoted and, and relaunched as an energy technology company. And I say that is a little bit different because we have, um, we have everything from the turbine side and our turbo machinery business to digital solutions that, that goes the entire um, supply chain to a value chain perspective for options in geothermal for sensors and such, uh, and then uh, down into the subsurface. But we look at it from a, a variety of ways because we look at at, at a um, at, at this more from an energy tech company perspective at this point. And so we do have our conventional uh, things that we look at, but I'll give you an example about where we're headed. So we're looking, um, in, as, as you ask about electricity and direct use, we, we continue to play into low temperature applications like with, um, with um, greenhouses and, and direct use capabilities. But we currently have a test site in Bavaria, um, Everloop, I think it's, I'm not sure I'm getting our pronunciation right, but um, this is a field trial where we're basically looking at something like EGS, but it's an advanced geothermal system that's basically uh, an underground radiator concept where you have a, a series of horizontal and lateral wells that you're trying to, to use as, as the field play. And so, so we would, we're looking at all of the options right now, and we've oftentimes we're very good at positioning uh, the cool new tool and tech uh, that's kind of, uh, I think that we really play to our strength as a technology company in, in that regard, but we've got to go to the next level and actually then, then get it to market beyond just tech development. So I see, and Baker Hughes sees geothermal in a variety of conventional and unconventional ways at this point. Thanks, Allison. And, Jamie, and, this, is, this is Patrick, if I can just add. Yeah, please. Um, going back to Merit's point, um, I think the perception has been that Either you're at low T and using direct use, meaning less than 120C, or you're in this high temperature environment. And really what we've done in the last 10 years is really push the low temperature for electricity generation. So we have a, a project in Nevada that produces 130C fluid at a very high flow rate, and we're producing a fair amount of power there. So the important thing about generating electricity is the temperature differential. So if you're in a Northern European country, um, that has 120C fluid that you can flow at a, at a high rate, you can make a lot of power with water cooling, for example. So um, it's important to remember that that low T electricity generation is really where the geothermal industry has made a lot of progress in the last 10 years. Right, and while while we have you, Patrick, I'll say there there's certainly a lot of discussion amongst operators right now um, in, in doing characterization, figuring out where blind, blind hydrothermal resources are around the world. Um, what what types of thoughts are you hearing from from the ore mats of the world, right? The 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 geothermal operators that have been in this game forever about um, either partnering or doing it yourself and trying to find new hydrothermal resources around the world. Well, so two things on that point. We are we have a partnership that um, I think was announced a few months ago with Medco, which is a pretty big oil company in Indonesia, and we're drilling wells in what you would describe as a traditional system. It's a volcano. It has surface manifestations of the surface. So globally, there are some really big systems left to develop. Um, in places where it's more challenging, uh, in Nevada, we've done a lot of work looking for, call it relic um, hydrothermal alteration. 
or you know a lot of data crunching to find the places where someone's ignored some lower temperature resource. So um, going back to, to Lance's point, when Shell and Chevron and um, and Phillips were doing geothermal exploration, they were very focused on 200 C or greater, and and what they found was a lot of 150C and it was ignored. And, and a lot of our business has been bringing those projects online again over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Thanks, Patrick. Scott, I want to throw one one to you. Um, and, and you know, every, everyone associates Texas as, of course, the, the, hydro the, the hydrocarbon capital of the world. There's certainly a, a very central ecosystem when it comes to oil and gas expertise, technologies, you know, headquarters even. Um, it's a gigantic business in the state. It is the state, right? And but there are a lot of um, there are a lot of entities around the world, like the Bureau of Economic Geology, um, that are interested in in thinking of geothermal themselves and figuring out how they might help or play in the space, including, quite frankly, also research institutions and national labs, et cetera. Can you give us some perspective, one, on the role of Texas in this? and to the role of entities like the Bureau of Economic Geology that have a legacy in oil and gas. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Texas is actually the wind capital of the world. <laughs> we have more wind and probably more hot air than uh, just about any place else in the world too. But, but uh, you know, it's interesting thinking about that. I remember we were making switch and I was visiting the president of Iceland. You go up to the White House in Iceland, which is a White House, but there's there's just a housekeeper. You walk in and there's the president. There's no you know, secret service or anything else. And, and Ragnar Olafur, he says, Scott, I think everybody in the world should go to geothermal. And I smiled and said, well, you know, that'd be great, but we're not all on a hot spot in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And, and, and we don't have 300,000 people. So the scale issue that's been brought up here several times now is vital. And that's where I think research organizations in places like Texas, Texas is a fairly uh, entrepreneurial state when you think about it, and energy in other ways too, much more broadly than just energy. But uh, you know, you think about what we've done in oil and gas, certainly in wind, and 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 then you start moving beyond that. We're starting to see some solar capacity. We've done a tremendous amount in coal and crappy old lignite, and they're shutting that in now. And and we have our own grid. You know, so uh, ERCOT is, is mostly a Texas-based grid. So I've had to adapt to a lot of different things with intermittent energy and, and steady electricity, et cetera. So I think that combination of governments and academics um, coming together with industry and NGOs to really address some of these big problems and what I lovingly call the radical middle is vital to this. If you don't all come in there and start looking at the data, compromising, really asking the tough questions as, as you go to economics and scale, things tend to not work so well, but Texas is a good place. It's a good prototype to begin to do some of that. Very interested in, in setting up those kinds of systems. So the Bureau, we're unique. We're the oldest research unit at UT, but we're the State Geological Survey of Texas. We've been around 111 years. And therefore, we have on our board a railroad commissioner, uh, Commissioner from TCEQ, Environmental Quality. We have the Land Commissioner of Texas, George B. Bush. We have the Comptroller of Texas, and we have Commissioner from Water Development Board on our Bureau Board. So as, along with many others, and it takes that kind of integrated thinking to really look at all the issues in order to be able to develop something, I think, that's uh, got fidelity and durability going forward. So big research groups like ours uh, provide that basis, but you got to go into the practical world as well. And I think that's where playing with the labs, uh, national labs, which we do, service companies, which are on this call and others is just vital. Everybody has the hats they wear and you come together in that integrated center and really work out some of those key challenges. All right, thanks, Scott. There's a, there's a good bit of uncertainty, particularly uh, surrounding scalable geothermal concepts. And, and, and Pivot's goal really is to dive into the technical details of a lot of those concepts, right? So the, the panel after this one is going to focus on EGS. There's a panel later in the week that's going to focus on the technology that Allison mentioned earlier, which is AGS, Advanced Geothermal Systems, or otherwise known as closed loop systems. Um, the company that she mentioned ever, the CEO, John Redfern, will be on that panel later on in the week. These are all very exciting but relatively new concepts that are not yet proven. Um, and there, there's a lot of excitement around them and a lot of technical discussions and, and collaborations to be had. 
But these types of uncertainties do make it difficult to build a firm uh, and eyes wide open geothermal strategy for organizations. I'd like to I'd, I'd like to just you know, tackle the question of what information you might need in your organizations. Um, what 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 data are you missing in order to help you build a geothermal strategy and know where you're going in the short, medium and long term? We can start with you, Merritt, since you've got a you are actually in an organization that that the goal is to do these things. Right. So you you have a geothermal strategy. And then we can just open it up to the panel to, to contribute to this. What information do you need um, that, you know, where's your, what data is missing that might help you um, build in the, in the years to come, starting with merit? Yeah, no, very good, because I think that high level approach that the IGA is taken and we are, we are having that mandate, if you like, to really influence that high level agenda when it comes down to building geothermal into the strategic notifications and let's say directives of the countries, because ultimately the goal is to go to net zero. Let's assume we all want to achieve that. And then let's look at the different continents, how they tackle that. Let's all assume that everybody wants to, to reach that same objective of having that net zero future in 2050. And maybe the journey is different from country to country because of other types of renewables coming to stronger. Wind, solar, uh, hydrogen is of course also a topic very high on the agenda for many of our, uh, let's say, uh, other industry associations that I'm dealing with. But ultimately what it comes down to is that we need to be at someone's level, whether that is the country government, whether that is the National Commission for Energy Transition, whether that are the Shells and the Totals and the BPs and the Baker Hughes and the Ormats, if you like, that geothermal is one of the key technologies to deliver on that net zero future. Because otherwise, if you're not mentioned at that high level, whether you're, if you're not mentioned in World Bank notification for the key technologies entering into the strategic directives for, and you know what I'm talking about, IEA Paris, they're gonna bat on two fundamental technologies, offshore wind and hydrogen. Why are we not mentioned? Either IEGA as a whole has done a severely bad job or we have not unitedly stand up and talk to each other strategically enough and said, you know what, maybe through the electricity and the electrification, maybe through the direct use, maybe through the lobby for geothermal everywhere. I don't mind what it is, but unitedly we shall stand to make geothermal a technology of choice for the net zero future. In terms of data, I want to see companies unite in that mission. I want to see a strategic goal that says, if we don't do geothermal, we're not going to make Paris. Pledge to those net zero future is nothing if you just do that over solar and wind. I can go on for a very long time, but that is ultimately at a high level goal that the IGA set itself for. And it is very difficult, I can assure you, to really make that high level strategic notification for geothermal in those books. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I'll just throw it out to the rest of the panelists too, and, and we'll see this in some of the audience questions. I'm getting the audience questions. There's there's some really good ones, but let's. I want to let you guys um, comment on this question before we jump. But I, but I will say there is a um, there is a misconception about geothermal, even in the very um, high levels of organizations. Um, that is the geothermal of the past, right? It's not scalable. It's niche. It's expensive. Why bother? Um, what What do you think in your organizations? And any of you can comment on this about how to change that perception in in executive teams of companies so we can all come together, like Merritt is saying, and actually form a coalition and get stuff done. I'll, I'll comment uh, on what Merritt was saying. I, I think the key thing is we've got to we've got to go out there and show them that we can deliver at competitive cost with wind and solar. That's the fundamental thing right now. I'm I'm not going to invest big money in geothermal until you show me that. And as soon as one of these startups proves they can do that, it things will start happening. But that's the big barrier in my mind right now, and that 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 is just the cost per kilowatt. And uh, like Scott said, I think the place to prove it is in Texas. They're they're very open. You can do it. You can do it quickly. And there's some hot spots. You go down around South Texas. You go out around El Paso. 
Uh, you've, you've got some, it's deep stuff, 17,000 to 20,000 feet, but we've been drilling it for years for gas. And we can go out there and, and use, actually prove concepts using existing wells. And once we prove that, once we show that this isn't just pie in the sky, that there is a road to, to uh, Nirvana, uh, that uh, I, I think things will start happening very quickly once that happens. Lance, can you define Nirvana? I've heard that term brought up from op operators use that term often, and I don't. Can you define that for the audience? What is an, what is Nirvana for an operator? Well, I think Nirvana is, in my mind, is distributed power, right? So you're able to go out anywhere in the world and drop a well uh, and get down to deep enough that you can get. Uh, in in my mind, I I. I, I I'm targeting 200 degrees C, right? If we if we can do it with uh, lower temperatures, fantastic. Then then you don't have to go as deep. But there's a budget you've got. If you're gonna if you're gonna meet uh, wind and solar, you're gonna have to be able to drop your wells to 20,000. You're gonna have to be able to get them to 20,000 feet in the eight to 10 million dollar range. And you're going to need to build your surface 10 kilowatt, uh, 10 megawatt surface plant for around the same eight to ten million dollar range then you're competitive with uh with uh wind and solar uh but then they're they're moving fast so uh then you're gonna have to go into a learning curve and uh, get the cost down from there but i think uh, i think there is a path we're gonna have to demonstrate that there's there's a path to nirvana Right now, it's like Oz without the yellow brick road, right? We, we need to show that there's a path, there's a yellow brick road that'll, uh, that'll get us to Nirvana and then everybody will show up. I think the government will show up and uh, big oil will show up, everybody will show up. Jamie, can I, uh, this is Scott, can yeah. I add one thing there? Uh, Please. Uh, you know, I think Lance is right there for sure that one one thing I think that's not played out probably well enough for sources of energy that are not intermittent is that they don't require some of the same things that intermittent sources do. And so even when you looked at, at some of the LCOE or, or the levelized costs of things, they don't include the transmission, they don't include the backup. Those costs don't include batteries and they don't include load following plants. So. There's a reason com countries like Germany and states like California and others pay more at the, as a user for their end use electricity. And so we continue to say they're cheap, but they really aren't. You know, when you get down to the end use because of those additional costs, and I think geothermal can step in here in a way that is not intermittent. It, it, it certainly requires, it's a resource and requires management. You see that in Iceland, even where it's right at the surface, they have to move wells, et cetera. But, it can be an always on steady, even base load source of electricity that is quite different. And I think that has to be communicated better to decision makers and policy makers because they don't understand these things. Um, you know, they hear the politics and they hear the lobbyists and they hear all the other people and the loud voices. But it's really important for people who understand energy to talk about why those differences matter significantly to the end use cost because it's the people at the end of the day that are paying for that whether it's through taxes or at their meter or wherever else and i just think that's a point that maybe gets lost with geothermal's messaging how about nirvana from from a you know from a geothermal company's perspective patrick what is what is the the perfect and ideal out outcome in terms of scale in the next 10 years look for for you that's a great question i think you know, really a lot of it is the off taker and Merritt's point is, is important that the governments don't realize how valuable it is. And, and what Scott said about it being baseload is 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 critical. But um, we have already demonstrated that the cost is competitive with with wind and solar with with today's technology. And a lot of it's just getting that message out. So we have so far in the last 10 years, a, a small voice, but I guess I, I haven't used the term Nirvana very much relative to, to our business. It's but, an oil and gas term. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, for us, we're, we're, we're already growing that way. And I think what the oil companies need to see is that there is that potential. And to the geothermal anywhere, I think it is possible to do it anywhere. The question is going to be, where is it best from a, from a technical and geologic standpoint, um, but also from a regulatory standpoint, because the economics are going to be better somewhere. And some of what we need to identify is where is that? Where can we do geothermal anywhere and actually make money? Because right now it's still a research topic. 
but it's it's exciting and there's a lot of work to do. In the meantime, we're still putting conventional projects on. And as I said, there are hundreds of megawatts readily accessible um, in some places that are difficult politically. So I want to throw out one and let's go ahead, Allison. Yeah, I, you know, the talk about what data that we need, getting back to your original question, I, I do think that there are, if you look geographically, there is data in market economics that, that show that there are certain areas in particular that, that have some near term and midterm opportunity. OK, I think a lot of the times when you, you have a very sort of US centric panel here that that the the um, prospects not in the US are, are sometimes sort of glossed over. So there's a lot out there in the world uh, getting to something Scott said on the policy side. Uh, I will just say that there has been a bill that gets proposed every year that has been proposed for nearly 12 years that would provide parity for geothermal siting in the US with oil and gas. That's 12 years, OK? And when I, I before this call, I was on a call with a notable, I'm not going to say who it is, but a notable policy center located here in DC. And I asked, like, because they said, what are the policy agenda for, for the sector right now when you're thinking about energy transition? And I said, well, for us, I'd like, I'd like to see parity so that when we talk about citing things and we talk about project length and we talk about the economics a lot of the economics here in the u.s play out because the duration to time to permit and first first development is long okay compared to some other energy projects and so i i asked i said when you convene people through your policy center do does everyone have are we included in clean energy standards as geothermal and the answer was no and I asked why, and it was because the people that they convened had never really thought about it. So I'll just leave you with that. So I think we have some work to do as an as an industry. Yeah, and this this actually touches on one of Merritt's points, which is the uh, absence or or the um, the very small lobbying footprint that geothermal has had in the world globally. Um, really, in 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 trying to get even, uh, you know, the solar and wind industries both have very strong lobbies now. Oil and gas, of course, has for a very long time, and geothermal kind of lands in this middle ground where you know it's 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 an under resourced industry. Nobody's heard of it. Um, the lobbyists are are out there, but there's very few of them, right? And they're just not getting they're they're not you know, we're not able to get the message across. So what's the you know what's the best way to fix that? Because that, you know, it, it seems to me that that there needs to be some sort of major, major consortium. I mean, what what say you, panel? Well, this is Patrick, and I agree. A, a major consortium would be valuable. But you you've pointed out the permitting is different for us than it is for oil and gas, for example. We we have a different bill that you know was written in the '70s, and and we're we're treated a bit differently. So. It may be that something as simple as saying we have the same rules for how long it takes me to get a permit pretty much fixes it. If, if you say, you know, the Geothermal Act is maybe not so relevant. I, I don't know if my company would uh, would back up what I'm saying there, but um, <laughs> but if we had the ability to drill wells quickly, um, a lot of this would be fixed because, as you said, the, the investment timeline is long. It takes us five years, four years, maybe optimistically to bring a project online. Um, and a lot of that, a year and a half is usually waiting for a permit sometimes much more than a year and a half, just waiting for a first exploration full size well permit. And Jamie, this is Scott. I would I would add to what Patrick saying. I think it's really important in the messaging to convey the environmental impacts of all forms of energy. You know, right, right now we have this clean and dirty and good and bad mantra going on, which you know, drilling for geothermal wells is drilling wells. Let's not sugarcoat it. It's going to take that. There's going to be some drilling and, and perhaps disruption and surface use and water and things. It's it's environmentally impactful. So is oil and gas, so is coal mining. Guess what? So is drilling for all the metals and rare earths to build wind turbines, solar panels and batteries. And at a much different mining scale than anything we're talking about here because there's so much stuff needed to collect it. I just don't think we're being candid about the environmental impacts of all forms of energy to the public. And so you don't have to beat up on one or the other or compare yourselves, but we do need to be candid so that school kids and 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 policymakers and and whoever don't think clean, dirty, good, bad. And then they go down the road and they go, why are all these mines here? 
And why are we dumping so many batteries into landfills? You know, uh, oops. And so that's where geothermal really shines. It's a subsurface resource that isn't a carbon-based one. <laughs> You know, I think it, there's some great messaging to be made here. It, it, look, I could probably do it. I don't know anything about marketing and, and messaging, but let's let's get let's get that out there. It matters. Yeah, Scott, I think that's an an excellent point, and it's it's one that is glossed over, quite frankly. The the negative externalities of of current traditional renewables, right? And and really getting all of these facts on the table. So then policymakers can make informed decisions about what they what they support. And I, I am totally on board with that. And your comment is an excellent segue to my last question. Um, Jamie, before, can, can, yes. can I let, let me interrupt real quick? Because yeah, sure. this, this was a key reason I was worried about getting involved in this and checking out my understanding and what I, we're going to have to test this is that like in Texas, if you've got an oil field that's already got the environmental impact and everything done, you can ask for administrative relief and ask to get drilling permits under the uh, the drilling regime. So we haven't tested that yet, but uh, if you can go for administrative relief, make the case for administrative relief. And my perception is right now with the need to get oil rigs and oil people back to work in the U.S., that that administrative relief in Texas is a viable route to go. I haven't tested it. I don't know if anybody has, but it'd be an interesting thing to test. Thanks, Lance. To, to follow up a little bit on, on, on Scott's point about being honest and, and really um, making sure that we are um, discussing facts and trying to um, consider the energy mix of the future, um, I'm going to throw out the F word here to the panel, and and let's have a little bit of discussion about that. So there, you know, there one of the scalable geothermal concepts, and it's the one that's going to be considered by the next panel after this one, is enhanced or engineered geothermal systems, or EGS. Now EGS, it's called it's it's called other things by the industry, but again, that's a strategic decision that may not be fully honest, right? So. You know, EGS projects do leverage hydraulic fracturing techniques, right? They're different than the oil and gas industry, but the concepts are the same. And so the, the question for you guys is from a strategic standpoint, because we're going to dive into the technical aspects of EGS in the next panel. But from a strategic standpoint in all of your companies, uh, you know, Scalable geothermal concepts that involve hydraulic fracturing is wrought with complexities, right? You've got PR considerations you need to deal with. You have public education situations that you need to deal with. Quite frankly, even explaining the differences between EGS and fracking in the geothermal context versus the oil and gas context. These are big mountains that have not yet been climbed by the geothermal industry. What does, you know, and I, I would take answers from all of you because we have a lot of different perspectives on this panel from, from government to geothermal industry to oil and gas, right? I imagine all of your, all of your, your, the way you would handle this might be quite different. But, you know, how would you step through um, building a strategy around EGS, engaging in EGS, recognizing that we have a lot of work to do in getting EGS to be accepted by, you know, communities that it exists in, you know, what, where can we make sure we're, how do we can make sure we're keeping the social license of geothermal if we start doing EGS at scale? What are your thoughts? I'll, I'll start, Jamie. So, I, I mean, I'll just tell you what our strategy is at SAGE, and that is, uh, just like Scott said, South Texas, there's, there's heat down at the 17, 20,000 foot range. We've been fracking that stuff for decades, right? And the jackrabbits don't have lawyers, so you don't have to worry about it. And, they, and there, there, there are some seismic events, but there's nothing ever major. So we go there, collect the data, pre, prove it works with the data, both on the cost front and the seismic front. We can then go out from the South Texas environment and show regulators with real data exactly what we've exactly what we've got. And I believe 
like I said earlier, with administrative relief, we could actually go out and do this fairly easily without a five year permitting uh, strategy. If it's going to take five years then I've got problems, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And so our intent is to actually do some fracking. It's a hybrid system that we've developed and uh, uh, our, our ideal place will be in the South Texas area and possibly even using existing well bores. That's all. Anybody, anybody else want to take a crack at this one? How Patrick is is ORMAT interested or engaging in in or considering engaging in EGS in the future? So our engagement with EGS so far has been primarily, I'll call it infield. So let's say we drill a low permeability well near some successful wells or near some known fractures. Um, we've uh, worked with the Department of Energy to. Um, you know, really, as I said earlier, it's a research topic. So we've worked with them to see can it work in field, and that's really been the extent of our of our work. We've um, certainly not recently picked up any leases with the idea of EGS in mind. All of our work on a, on the exploration side is focused on again conventional um, resource, and I, I still liken this to the difference between conventional and unconventional oil and gas. A few years ago, half of the oil and gas produced was still in a conventional yeah. setting, and and so. There's still for us a lot of growth there. Um, in terms of making a strategy, I think Lance is exactly right. You, you're going to need to start where there's not a lot of people. I, I think um, starting and demonstrating that it works and demonstrating that it's not hazardous and you know having micro seismicity measured, all of the things that people have expressed concerns about. And as you said, highlighting the differences. What's different about this from oil and gas where people maybe have expressed concern about fracking before? Excellent. Yeah, if I could just um, sure. quickly put it, put another perspective in here. I think it's, I think that's good. You know, years ago when EGS, um, um, I think Jeff Tester is coming and speaking at a, another um, another panel. But his his future of geothermal report is they're talking about EGS and the Wayback Machine. There was some sidebar joking that happened at the time that the best place that you could do these projects was like in the Australian outback, right? <laughs> because no one was there to see if something went wrong. And and I say that um, with a slightly uncomfortable, um, so I'm saying that and I'm uncomfortable, okay? Because um, we, we have an obligation in anything that we do in energy to own it, okay? Um, if if there are things that are good or bad, and I think one of the reasons why industry and other other doesn't matter what industry, every industry is dogged by. Now I'm putting on my ESG hat right now, so just know that, that this is the perspective I'm coming with, is that when we don't come in to communities in advance and do that advance work, that's where we're hurt. And I've heard many people in many forum in the oil and gas setting say over the years, well, it doesn't really matter if we try to do this in advance. You know, there are always going to be people in communities that don't like it. Well, th that doesn't mean you don't try and it doesn't mean you, that you don't own it and have transparency and the pluses and minuses. And that goes for renewables. That goes, through, this goes back to what Scott said on on environment. We need to to be transparent in how we operate. OK, and then I think you start to show the good and the bad, whether it's in your ESG report or in when something happens, the operators that stay and don't walk away from it um, have credibility in communities. And there's been a lot of work that's been done on that in social license. In fact, you can point to some CCS examples that happened early in the carbon um, sequestration work that the DOE did that with the state of Ohio in particular. So, so you know, Baker Hughes has a compliance slogan and it's it's two words, it's, it's own it. So in this case, I would say, we should own any part of it, the good and the bad, and just be upfront with communities and, and don't shy away from doing it in communities with people, but just have smart dialogues. Yeah, maybe if I could, I was going to build on that a little bit. I had some similar thoughts, but I think it's it's um, it's not just informing, it's, um, it's engaging people who think it's a bad idea very early to understand where the concerns are coming from. You know, Jamie, you and I talked about this a little bit on the panel prep, but our industry really is an insul insular industry. A lot of people spend their whole career and, you know, so you end up talking to people who think the same way that you do. And I think the, you know, collectively the industry response to frack was, wasn't the F word before frack has been around a really long time, but it became the F word because 
as an industry, you know, we kind of collectively dismissed public perception by saying, well, that's wrong. And I, I think, you know, building a bit on what Allison said is that you don't convince people that it's a good thing when you say you're wrong. You understand what perspective they're coming from and and address what that concern is if you really want to be in the space. So also my ESG hat. Yes, and, and those are uh, those are actually both of your comments like are, are 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 very interesting are, and helpful are, are, because one of the one of the things that I've noticed in engaging with um, NGOs on on scalable geothermal, um, particularly um, when I start talking about the oil and gas industry, um, wholesale buying this, doing it at scale, it becomes the oil and gas industry kind of thing. When you start thinking of the big stuff, there is a lot of discomfort, and that discomfort comes from history, right? So it comes from experience and there's 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 mistrust already um, between the industries, the, the oil and gas industry and environmental groups, right? And so I um, the, the messages that you've both said, I think are indicative of a change that oil and gas has made in the last years um, in trying to reach out and be more proactive about uh, engagement. And I think that's that could that's going to be really helpful for geothermal. So we can, are. Can I add one thing real quick? Yes, please. Just real please. quick. I mean, it's ironic the ESG and the EGS that you know they're pretty yeah, right. similar, uh, but 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 the E part of of environmental, social, and governance is important, and that E seems to be dominated by climate change right now. Fair enough, but that's the you know those atmospheric emissions component. That's where I think some education with those groups that are most passionate about that issue would be well placed because again geothermal has no emissions um, it truly doesn't and it can scale when done correctly so it's the scale that's the big deal you go out in west texas now and everybody's sort of happy about all the wind and they're getting royalties but you know when the red lights on top of the turbines are all blinking in unison at night and you're looking for et to come out of the sky because it feels surreal you start thinking, is this going to be here forever? Well, yeah, it is. And in fact, we have to replace them. You know, we're starting to take down these giant turbines and replacing them with more mining and more metals. And so Allison's point about own it is brilliant because everybody has to own it. Everyone in the energy at scale needs to own it. And so own this, get out in front. And and yeah, hydraulic fracturing, fracking was a big discussion. It's kind of gone a little bit quieter on that front with other things that have come up. These things come and go, but but own it. And I think geothermal has a lot of good to own and some challenges, and so does everything else. And so get out in front, and then others are going to be looking around going, wait a minute, you know, Elon, we love you, but you didn't tell us to power half the world's vehicle fleet was going to require 3 trillion lithium ion batteries. That's not a made up number. 3 trillion. And where how are we going to make them all? Where are they going to come from? And where are they going to go? You know, And so own it. That's a that's brilliant. Love it, Allison. <laughs> I can't take the credit. I'm sure someone brilliant at Baker Hughes, but it's a whole campaign, and and we believe it, and and I'm happy to share it. So here's a here's a question from the audience, and it it's in line with our with our current discussion, and um, and I love the question because it does show. Um, that we're bringing together in pivot very different types of people. Um, stakeholders that are listening come from all over, governments and NGOs, oil and gas, geothermal, national labs, academics, we've got everybody. And the questions are really showing that, and I think it's beautiful. But even on our panel, we have very different um, perspectives. And so, and this question really leverages that. So I'm gonna read it word for word, it's perfect. Quote, jackrabbits don't have lawyers. So this is Lance, this is uh, in, in response to your comment. That would never fly outside of the United States. You gotta love Texas. So I wanna hear Merritt's take on that comment. So, okay, so this is US versus European perspective, um, you know, fracking versus bans, et cetera. What do you think, Merritt? Yes, very good. I was uh, I was thinking the same. It was not my question. I did not type that in the chat, please. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, this is a very maybe even Texan focused sort of quote that you throw out there, Lance. And I understand it. I have been in Houston quite a bit and I understand where you're coming from. So don't get me wrong. But yes, we are the International Geothermal Association. We operate in 64 countries. The world is very different very different outside the US. And indeed, you will not go very far with that 
with that in mind that jack rabbits do not have lawyers i think everybody has a lawyer and everybody has a voice even the dolphins in the north sea have a voice because if they don't have a voice someone will imitate their voice and will go out with a banner saying stop offshore wind so I think engagement, I like to own it as well. I think that's very strong. What I would also like to see is that everybody owns it, that everybody owns it. I am a fundamental believer that the world of energy is going to be different in 10 years from now. We're all going to be prosumers. We're not even going to be consumers. We're all going to be prosumers. So we're going to own energy. And with that in mind, I think we're all going to be our own lawyers as well, because is there justice in the subsurface? Yes, there is. And to whom does it belong? That's another strategic question that we all have to ask ourselves. Who owns the heat beneath our feet? In which book of law is it written that it's owned by the state, by the community, by the person who owns the piece of land? It's not. So it still requires a conversation on engagement. And if I look at the 345 power plants that there are in geothermal, they are all unique, they're all different, and they're all engaging with the community. You need people to support people. You need geothermal to be supported by people. And yes, I mean, I get the Texan approach towards let's, let's go somewhere where there is not so much people. But ultimately, I fundamentally believe that geothermal is local for local. It's not a commodity. We're not going to sell geothermal as a global trade thing. This is about producing power or utilizing the resource beneath our feet. And for, for that, I think we should seek engagement and ownership indeed in our local community. But thank you for the question. I think it's- <laughs> can, can I, can yes, I chime yes, in? Yes, Lance, rebuttal. So, so there, there was a TV show in the US called, you know, everybody wants to go where everybody knows your name, right? And South Texas, everybody knows our name. We've we've been there. They love energy. Uh, you know, you look in Texas. That's where the wind capital of the world is. You look at the oil capital. It's West Texas. Everybody knows our name. We will go out there and forget the jackrabbits. Uh, they will welcome us. And we have been doing exactly what we've been doing for decades. And we'll go do it in a geothermal context. Instead of getting gas out of those fractures, we're going to be getting heat out of those fractures. That is the conversation we'll have to have with the landowners and the people in the area. And I promise you, they will say, we trust you. We love you. Come on. We will, we will love to get the royalty checks from geothermal in the future. With that database, with that stuff, then we go around the world and people will have to choose. Here is the data. Here is what we're getting out of the ground with a very small footprint in South Texas. Are you interested or not? If people aren't interested, then, then that is absolutely their right. But you only go where everybody wants your name, you own it, and everybody wants you to be there. And, that, and, and, and that's Texas, right? I've, I've been working in Texas. I was grew up in Texas. I work globally, um, and uh, that will be the easiest place to uh, to get something in the ground, prove it. Uh, I'm 63 now. If I go, if I go try to do this in some other places, I'll be long dead before we ever get a permit. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. So we we have only a few minutes left, and I want to get to a couple more of these questions. Here, I, here we are with the next question. I work for Total. The other day, I personally asked one of our board of directors who is responsible for renewable energy what his view of uh, what is what his view of geothermal was. He replied, it's expensive and it's too small scale. Therefore, I'm not interested. What should I tell him the next time I see him in the elevator? Anyone take it launch. I, I I'll, I'll, I'll just say you need you, you need to invest in a, a bunch of these startups and see which one actually shows that there is a road to the scalability. Uh, if, if I were senior management in a big company, that's exactly where I'd be. Right now, nobody's proven it. This stuff's been around for years. Prove to me that you can get these costs downs and do it in a scalable way. And, uh, and in the meantime, I'd be on this. I wouldn't be on the sidelines. What I'd be doing is I'd be investing 10 million in this small company, 10 million in that small company, and have what I would call options so that as soon as somebody comes up with that roadmap to Nirvana, 
that I've got a seat at the table and I can come in and play in a big way. What do you say, Allison? I'm, I'm going to have to uh, disagree that this is tech that's been around for a long time and geothermal has been been deployed at scale for a long time in different areas. You go where the heat is. Really, the expansion play is is into areas that are the lower temperature and in other applications. And so so I do think that that for really big companies, I mean, it, you know, I can point to point four fingers back at myself as I point to to other companies that are out there where people look at really big margins. OK, uh, but sometimes in in to make the energy transition that we're talking about, we're going to have to invest in a slightly smaller play to scale up. The markets are there. OK, and and for areas where we've got to prove up tech, you, you can partner with the federal government or nation state governments in other areas as well. OK, that is a very good way to build some of the social license that we've talked about to also show that you're investing in communities and leveraging uh, federal nation state kinds of money at the same time. OK, it doesn't have to be a startup. Actually, I, I think we get a lot of great credibility in the fact that we can say that we've operated safely and in the case of Baker Hughes for 117 years. So, so I'm sorry, Scott, we're, we're about 10 years older than you guys are, or maybe six or seven. So, so at any rate, I, I, I'm just going to have to reiterate, it's been around a long time, and I think that track record will serve as well in terms of scale up. You know, Jamie, uh, this yeah. is Scott. Um, to that board member, I probably wouldn't say something like those are really nice shoes you're wearing. Where do you get them and start with a compliment of some kind and then and then ask if there's any data that would change. I think they said his. So let me go with his mind. If there are any data that would change his mind because perception is reality and many people they're unchangeable. You know, they're at a point where they're unbendable. So you, you decide whether or not to spend time with that individual based on them and their knowledge saying yes, these data would. Show me where it can be done at scale. Show me where it economically compete. What are the and if they if they have an understanding at that level, then you have a place in which you can play. If there's no data that could come forward to change that person's mind, then you're probably spinning your wheels and that would go across a politician. It would go across somebody in an NGO who was already entrenched. It would go across a big investor, et cetera. But a lot of people don't know yet. So they they parrot what they hear and they think about that question. What would change my mind? And then you got some running room. Thanks, Scott. Um, Jamie, this last is question. Patrick. Yes, please. Sorry, just quickly. I, I would yeah. agree with what Scott said, but also I think understanding what is it that a company like Total needs? Is it is it a gigawatt? Is it 10 gigawatts? Understanding that and thinking about which of these technologies might be more. more and again, I would push the idea that for a company like Total, a big offshore play might really get them there if they understood how much is there. Thanks, Patrick. And and for for everyone watching in the audience, um, the 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 very last panel of the session on Friday will will dig into offshore a little bit. So tune in tune in there. Um, that's a that's a subsurface strategy panel, and there's some offshore proponents in that panel. Last question for everybody before we have to run. Most modern industries rely on crowdsourced public data analysis to move the needle on pressing industry questions. What public domain resources, databases, public corporate initiatives and partnerships are there or should there be to help build this future for the geothermal industry? So yeah, so this is a question that I think um, you know we can we can try to address because it you know there may be something that exists in geothermal that oil and gas doesn't have access to or vice versa. That's for certain. Uh, oil and gas has a ton of data, um, and even consortia to share data. But how about cross industries? Does anything exist now? And if not, how do we build it? No takers. You guys don't want to build a, a cross industry construction. Okay. Right. okay. This, this is a beautiful question. <laughs> I mean, just think about this. If we want to build, for instance, and we'll throw out an example, if we want to build global temperature at depth maps that are pretty accurate right now, we don't have them. We don't have good ones, right? If we want to build that as a, as, as a foundation to get oil and gas excited about the potential scale, how do we go about doing that? Because the data is all over the place and it's all in entities and proprietary in some in some ways. 
Is there any example you can point to? Yeah, so so um, years ago, this dialogue was held at the fed U.S. federal level, actually, where where the then Assistant Secretary Glenn Alred convened a bunch of different stakeholders throughout the federal government to try to get it. How do we use the public's, you know, public data, all of the data that sits there through federally funded projects and make it available to people, right? And it was he was actually too ahead of his time, I think. And and we had a hard time getting it to launch because as everybody knows, when you pull in a bunch of disparate data sets, they all have to be quality assured and you know, you've got to get them on the right platform. But but then uh, came around the concept of a cadaster. So there are uh, there are applications and artificial intelligence that now can go out and look for that. And I was actually trying to Google it. Uh, Microsoft, not in this space, but maybe this would be the next level for Microsoft, has, a, has an Earth platform that's an artificial intelligence platform where they can collect data about um, biodiversity at a global scale. Probably some people on this call and attending the conference have heard of it. And that's a, a rather large initiative that they've undertaken. It plays to the core strengths, but why not an Earth and have it be a layer that we we collect a lot of that publicly available data and do in the private sector what the U.S. government couldn't do with all of that publicly available data that's hard to get. And think about how it would reduce permitting times if suddenly you could go out and find all of the different layers that you need to apply for a permit, right? Have it all in one space. So does it exist right now? Unfortunately, I, I don't know of any, but it could. And I'd say Microsoft is really trying to pioneer something quite cool with their with their big artificial intelligence platform. I, I think if you if you've if you've got to talk to somebody, Jamie, the the, the ultimate scorecard is Lazard, right? So there's if, if you want to see how people are uh, competing in different areas, be it wind, solar, geothermal, Lazard does a nice levelized cost analysis of uh, all the different technologies uh, at that level. If you're not aware of the Lazard efforts. Thanks, Lance. I hate to stop the discussion now because there's a hundred questions, more than a hundred questions, and um, and and we have a lot of of awesome panelists. But we've got to go um, because our next panel starts in 30 minutes, and we are we are we are out of time. So. I wanted to thank everyone for, for joining, particularly the panelists. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, the next panel starts in 30 minutes. Please use the link um, for that panel to sign in as audience. And, and, and we will see you then um, and, and hope all of you in the audience will join us for the rest of Pivot pivot through the rest of the week where we're going to dig into a lot of the things these panelists mentioned, but we, did, we didn't have time to touch on, like, for instance, permitting, regulatory. We even have someone that is going to discuss who owns heat. Um, as Merritt mentioned, offshore geothermal, closed loop systems, EGS, which is next, all of it. So we look forward to seeing you all in the audience later in the week. And thank you very much. And we'll see you later. Bye.